All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Clearwater Public Library. I'm Jake Peterson with ABC Action News. Today, we will be taking part in an informative debate on the topic of guardianship for our Florida seniors, specifically the question of, are Florida seniors endangered by guardianship? This debate will last about an hour long. The debaters will give a brief opening here at the beginning, and then I will ask a series of questions that they will both respond to. They will have five minutes to respond to those questions. And then you, the audience, you will also get a chance to ask your questions. You will hear several perspectives on this topic by our experts. So let's meet those experts. To my left here is Dr. Sam Sugar. Hello, everyone. And to my right, Mr. Fernando Gutierrez. Dr. Sugar was born in Sweden after World War II as the first child to his Shoah survivor parents. At age two, Sam crossed the Atlantic with his parents and came to the United States, where they laid down a solid foundation and deep roots in and around Chicago and South Florida. Sam earned his elite status as an Edmund J. Scholar and graduated, Edmund James Scholar, and graduated with honors from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he earned his bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology in two and a half years. He earned his MD degree at the University of Illinois, Abraham Lincoln College of Medicine in Chicago. His postgraduate training included chief residency in internal medicine, that was at Evanston, Evanston Hospital and Northwestern University Medical Center. Dr. Sugar has been on the faculty of Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, as well as the faculty of Rush Medical College in Chicago. He is a board certified specialist in internal medicine with nearly 40 years of successful private practice and executive and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial experience. After ending his Chicago era, after ending his Chicago area career at Evanston as medical director for managed care, Dr. Sugar moved to Florida, where he enjoyed nearly a decade of practice at the Predican Longevity Center, working with business leaders, celebrities, political leaders, and dignitaries in their attempts to maximize their wellness. Dr. Sugar retired from full-time practice in 2012. As a result of the uncalled for and tragic guardianship of his mother-in-law, in which Dr. Sugar was accused, simply by a predatory lawyer falsely alleging them with no, proof, with no proof whatsoever of the most heinous crimes imaginable, including attempting to kill his mother-in-law, Dr. Sugar undertook his personal quest to not only clear his good name and sterling reputation, but to tackle what he found to be the nationwide epidemic of involuntary for-profit for professional guardianship. In 2013, he formed Americans Against Abusive Probate Guardianship whose membership has steadily grown and includes affiliates all over the USA. In 2015, AAAPJ-PG was successful in its first attempts of shepherding the passage of Senate Bill 5 by unanimous vote of 142 to 0. This legislation, which was enacted into law on July 1st of 2015, was the first significant reform of guardianship in decades and has gained Dr. Sugar and his organization gravitas across the country as voices of reasons and experts in advocating, educating, and legislating for the good, the public good. AAAPG has affiliates in states across the country, including Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, among others. In addition to its Florida-based legislative activities, AAAPG has produced a full-length documentary to demonstrate the plight of abusive guardianship, guardianship victims and their families. It's called Breaking the Silence, Guardian Abuse, Neglect, and Exploitation of the Elderly. Dr. Sugar lives in South Florida with his wife, Judy, and their miniature poodle, Lucy. They are the proud grandparents of 11 wonderful grandchildren. Dr. Sugar. Mr. Fernando Gutierrez is a Florida registered professional guardian since 2008. Mr. Gutierrez has specialized training in clinical health care ethics and consultations. He has attended numerous intensive educational courses at several institutions, including the National Catholic Bioethics Center, University of Washington, and University of Virginia Medical School, and Washington Hospital Center, where he has achieved certificates in healthcare bioethics. In June 2015, Mr. Gutierrez graduated from Union Graduate College, where he will complete his clinical bioethics training at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York with another certification in clinical bioethics. Mr. Gutierrez is a prominent is a prominent for more guardian training in healthcare. Currently, there are no requirements for guardians to even have a first aid certification, yet the majority of the registered guardians have court authority to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatments. 
The quality of health care for most vulnerable is jeopardized with the legal system emphasizes the financial perspectives of guardianship rather than the health and well-being of patients who could not defend themselves. This must change to improve the quality of professional guardians who provide a service that is truly noble. A process to weed out the undesirable guardians requires legislation implementing stricter training requirements. Those are our two debaters this afternoon. Okay, so we will be asking, or I will be asking each gentleman three questions. They have five minutes each to respond. Dr. Sugar, you will respond first to the question. And the first question, and then I will let you come to the podium. Did we skip the five minute opening? We did do that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm rushing through this here. Okay, so uh, we will start with our openings. Dr. Sugar, you have five minutes, then Fernando, you will do five minutes. Thank you. Pardon me while I set my timer. Okay. Good afternoon. I, uh, I wish I weren't here. I wish I were anywhere else but here. Um, I wish I had never heard of guardianship. I wish there weren't a single ward in the United States. And I wish that my mother-in-law, who died in guardianship, was still with us because my wife and I loved her very much. But like so many other wards who are trapped in a predatory guardianship system that is protected by a court system that encourages that kind of activity, she died in a vegetative state after having a massive stroke and lived for two years as a vegetable, able to hear and see, but not to talk or move. That's one of the reasons I guess I'm here today. Another reason is that on, uh, at the end, in spring of this year, I was a recurring guest, second time, on a program called Topical Currents in Miami WLRN Radio, public radio, the most popular South Florida public radio program where we were talking along with Kathleen Pasadomo, who was the sponsor of our legislation this past session. And a caller called up uh, and said that he disagreed with what we had done. I later got an email from that caller, who was Mr. Gutierrez, and I want to read it to you. Sugar, not Dr. Sugar, not Mr. Sugar, not dear Dr. Sugar. Sugar, your campaign categorized all guardians as thieves. Why are you misleading the public, period? Surely there must be guardians who have high morals and advocate for the best interests of the patient. Tell both sides of the story or risk losing credibility. Additionally, I invite you to a debate about guardianship at our, at our Pinellas County Guardian Association. Should you accept my offer, contact me, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't like being talked to like that. That's rather condescending. So I decided, although I had many reasons not to be here today or during the summer, I decided that I would take up that challenge. And I'm here today to talk to you about guardianship. And although I hadn't really planned to talk about this, I got a phone call at the airport this morning. I get about, eh, about a dozen calls a week from people who are in desperate situations, who are looking for any way, anyone, anything to help them out of this desperate abyss called for-profit guardianship. The call was from a woman um, in Volusia County, I don't want to identify her any other way than that, who talked to me about a week and a half ago and told me, what is this thing called guardianship and what are they trying to do to my mother or my father and my brother? Can you help me? Spent about an hour on the phone with her, explaining to her what was about to happen, and of course, it all came true. Uh, she told me today that her mother, her father, and her brother had all been taken into involuntary for-profit guardianship, and that $50,000 was removed from the parent's account instantly. And I had the sad duty of telling her, that's just the beginning, as all the victims of guardianship will agree with. I put together this little presentation. I know it's hard to read, but I want to give you two quotations from one of my favorite people, Albert Einstein, a pretty clever fellow. He said in about 1950, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And he also said, unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. 
both of those quotations have dramatic implications for the topic at hand. Because, let me just start my little slideshow here. All of the things that happen in guardianship are supposedly for the benefit of the war. But in fact, for-profit abusive guardianship is America's dirty secret. And it's my intention today, rather than spending a lot of time on answering the question, is guardianship a threat or a danger to Florida seniors? I'm going to give you my answer right now. I don't want to debate about it. Yes, it sure as hell is. And it's an existential and fundamental threat to your life, your wealth, your family, your well-being, and your actual existence. Because when your rights are removed from you, by a judicial process that strips you of the rights that the government is supposed to protect, you become completely vulnerable, you become a piece of property that is owned, and I want to say that three times, owned, owned like a dog by a total stranger. We have in the audience a number of victims. I'm sure that we, I, we can produce many, many more. I'm here to tell you not how it's supposed to work. You can maybe hear that from Mr. Gutierrez, or you can read about it in books. I'm going to tell you how it really works. I look forward to the opportunity. Thank you very much. Hello? Testing? Hello? Hello? I need to get this closer. Hello? Test, test. It's not on. My check, this one is on now. Do you want to go on? Welcome all. Um, again, Dr. Sugar did not tell the whole story. Yes, I did call him Sugar, but I corrected it in all my continuing correspondence. And just like he deserved the respect of Dr. Sugar, I expect to be addressed mystery. I'd like to thank the moderator, Jake Peterson from ABC News, and Dr. Sam Sugar for participating in this important and most often understood topic of guardianship. I have to give a disclaimer. Although I am a board member of the Florida State Guardian Association and the local Pinellas County Guardian Association, I am not speaking on their behalf. They were given the chance to co-sponsor this event and reluctantly they decided not to. But I am speaking as an individual guardian. Back in May, I along with my coll colleague Larry McDonough spoke at the Texas Public Guardianship Conference in Austin. Administrators told us that Florida guardian statutes are used as a baseline for the state of Texas. Florida is perceived as the leader for guardian standards and guardianship procedures. But if Florida is to maintain leadership status, constant changes to improve must continue to benefit those individuals adjudicated incompetent as well as addressing professional guardian competency and approaches to clinical decisions making for adult patients who lack decisional capacity. Dr. Mary Marshall, professor at the University of Virginia School of Medicine and Nursing, in her September 2014 article published in the Joint Commission Journal on Quality and Patient Safety, Professor Marshall is quoted as saying, Delays and inefficiencies in guardian petitions compound clinical problems for timely plans of care, end-of-life decisions, and impede safe patient discharge, unquote. Therefore, requiring professional guardians to obtain surrogate decision-making training or directing them to seek consultations with a specialist for adult patients who lack decisional capacity is a proper and bioethical protocol. The day has arrived when productive and positive dialogue must begin. Thank you. Okay, we'll begin the, the question segment of this, and Dr. Sugar will be answering first this question. The question, let's just kind of start at the beginning. What is the difference between a public and for-profit guardianship? And the time for this will be five, five minutes. Five minutes for this question. Very good. 
So, um, I'll use my, pro, my uh, PowerPoint. What you're about to hear is a warning to each of you that guardianship is a serious threat to your health and welfare. I want to explain how the system works, including answering that question. And I want to explain not what's supposed to happen, but what actually happens. And I want to make very clear, I am not an attorney. I do not and cannot give legal advice. We have predators in our courts. They isolate, litigate, medicate, and take the estate of vulnerable individuals and then dump that individual on public aid programs which you and I pay for, thereby wrongfully enriching multiple predatory lawyers, accountants, guardians, doctors, nursing homes, pharmacies, and others within the vic with the victim's money. And Mr. Gutierrez, I do agree with you, there are bad guardians in the state of Florida and other states. Imagine yourself then a stranger knocks on your door. Within two days, you are stripped of all your rights. All your money is credited, is totally confiscated. Your home, your car, your clothes, your pictures, your treasured photos, your jewelry, gone. Your family is attacked and isolated from you by trying to protect you. And then you're under the total control of a complete stranger who owns you. You're shipped off eventually to a public aid nursing home where you are over-medicated into submission, and on and on and on. Now, I'm not making this up because this is worse than fiction. I couldn't believe that any of this actually happens in the United States of America. But we've got witnesses here who will tell you that's exactly what happens. And it happens every day in the United States. So, to the point of your question, there are three different varieties at least, because there are always nuances. There is a guardian of the person, of the property, and sometimes of both. A per, uh, guardian of the person is in charge of most of the health care decisions, but doesn't necessarily get the money to take care of that ward. A ward is a person who needs a guardian. A guardian is a person who owns a ward. That has to be understood. And so, there are different types of those guardianships, family, public, professional, and others like ad litems. But we're here today to talk about family and public guardianships. By the way, can everybody see this fairly well? Yes. No, I'm sorry, the colors kind of get in the way. I'll do my best. Family guardians. Family guardians are family members, as the name would imply, who are required to take eight hours of training, not very much, but still required to comply to all of the issues in the biggest, longest, fattest statue in Florida. Statute 744, which contains almost all of the guardianship laws. Family guardians are not paid for their work at all. They are naive in the law, and that is their biggest problem. They usually are agreed to by family. They're usually a beneficiary of the estate plan. They're easily trapped by paperwork failures. That is their big problem. And they're easily discovered. Those errors are easily discovered by clerks of court's offices who audit what might be termed suspicious guardianships. And most of all, they ain't lawyered up. You will learn that the very first thing that a professional guardian does, a professional for-profit guardian, instantly lawyers up. And we have a lawyer in the audience, excuse me for saying so, Bill, but um, he'll tell you that story too. Public guardians, on the other hand, comprise about half of all the guardians in Florida. There's around 1,000 guardians in Florida, and more or less 50% are public guardians, and more or less 50%, give or take, are private for-profit guardians. The public guardians compete for cases from the Department of Elderly Affairs, who contracts with 17 different companies. I think in this area it's Aging Solutions, if I'm not mistaken to give services to all the indigents, because in order to be a public ward, you have to be indigent, around the counties, in 67 counties in Florida. They profit from guardianships no one else wants, and they do. They're compensated by the state for administrative services to the tune of $2,650 per year per ward. They generate income from skimming off the Social Security and other recurring benefits, and holding public fundraisers and any other means of raising capital that they can because they can. Let's do the math. I'm from Miami-Dade County, so I'm most familiar with that area. In Miami-Dade County, there are about 7,000 public wards. One agency, excuse me, I beg your pardon, I misspoke. 
There are about 7,000 guardianships at any time in Miami-Dade County. Of those, half, more around 3,200, are public guardianships, and one agency has half of those. So there is one agency who owns 1,600 lives. Dr. Sugar, we're reaching the five-minute mark. Fine, it's very profitable, and I will give you more on this as we go along, but the differences between public and private guardians are really very succinct, and I hope I'll have the opportunity to present them. Mr. Gugger, same question, please. Well, Dr. Sugar did explain public guardianship, so let me explain a little bit about the private side, of which I consider myself. The private, um, public, the private guardian runs their own business. Yes, we do it for profit. Uh, we have to pay our mortgage, we have to pay our light bills, we have expenses. But what is untold and is usually never said in the media is that private guardians have a caseload of pro bono cases, of which we don't get paid at all. I myself, the numbers are probably 20 or so of individuals who are indigent, who have no one, who I've taken time, and some of them are heavy maintenance cases, where I am visiting them not only once a week, twice a week, there are sick people with chronic and terminal illnesses, I attend and do my rounds at the hospitals in order to provide service for these people. So private guardian, yes, we're in it to get paid, just like any other profession. But what's not told is that we have many, many, and there's guardians in this room that we carry that are pro bono cases that no one ever hears about. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gutierrez, you will answer the next question first, which is, should guardian qualifications require health care training? Uh, well, I agree with uh, Dr. Sugar at this point. I, I, in a plenary guardian, not only are we responsible for the assets and finances of a patient, of which the court calls more, and I call them patients, but also the health care. And the fact is, is that these patients who have been adjudicated incompetent are also medically incapacitated. And what happens is when you have people with morbidities, several morbidities, people end up dying. And we as guardians have to make end of life decisions to withhold or withdraw life support. The court system is familiar with the finances. They're good at that, or at least monitoring those finances. But when it comes to the health care of these patients, nobody, not even the court, is asking, how did they die? Why did they die? Did you withdraw any medical treatment, or did you withhold medical treatment? Did you consult with a specialist before making this decision? Did you consult with not only the attending physician, but did you get a second opinion? Those answers are incomplete. And if we want to make our guardianship laws and statutes stronger, one that the whole nation looks up to, we have to tighten up and make qualifications where guardians must either have additional health care training or must seek a consultation with specialists. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sugar, you have five minutes for that same question. Should guardian qualifications require health care training? Well, I'm a pretty highly trained person. Uh, I've been through high school, college, medical school, internship, residency, chief residency. I'm pretty highly trained. But that has no impact on my morality or ethics. If you train somebody who's a sadist, all you get is a trained sadist. If you train somebody whose only goal is business ethics, meaning make as much money as you can without landing in jail, all you get is a highly trained businessman. Now, I wouldn't argue that education about health care is unnecessary. Of course not. But from our perspective and our group, if life or death decisions are going to be made about my loved one, 
The right person to make that decision is not a total stranger. Now, the stranger might say, I'm the only one who can be objective. I'm the only one who has the authority to do so. And I would answer, so what? This is my blood. This is my parent or my child. And I, in the eyes of God, if not in the eyes of the court, should have a tremendous say so in what their ultimate disposition is. Mr. Gutierrez says that the court system is not good at tracking, tracking what happens to the health of these patients. And I just have to laugh. Uh, it's not good at anything. It doesn't track anything. It doesn't monitor anything. If they did, the bad guardians that Mr. Gutierrez readily admits there exists in the state would be in jail today. If the court actually did what it was supposed to do according to 744, like listening to advanced directives, which are the one roadblock to guardianship, instead of pretending they don't exist until after everything's done, oh, there was an, oh, too bad, it's too late. And our friend Mr. Epley here and Ms. Vergara will tell you that the technical nonsense that goes on in probate court, if indeed it's just nonsense or lack of oversight, is abysmal. So the question was, if I recall correctly, would additional education make better guardians? And the answer is, I don't know, maybe. But additional education will not change the fact that guardians are in the business of making money. And you can't apply health care ethics to business ethics. Health care ethics are very clearly defined. And if we have time, I can read you what the Catholic University says about health care ethics that they must recognize advanced directives, that they must deal with families in a loving and, and helpful fashion. There is nothing about guardianship that applies to health care ethics, at least not in our experience. Now, Mr. Gutierrez has asked me, haven't you met one good guardian? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. He is a wonderful person. He is a person of great dignity and honor, and he has exactly one word. He's a nationally certified guardian, and he spends his own money on this young man that he has taken care of for years. I find him to be highly ethical and highly moral, and I find him to be one of the most wonderful people I've ever met. But if you ask me if I've met more than one, mm, I don't think so, at least not yet. I don't say who is and who isn't, but what I'm here to say loudly and clearly that there is a problem in this state. And I will just show you part of the problem that happens right here in Pinellas County. I don't think you can read that very well, but this is a screenshot from the Pinellas Guardianship uh, Facebook page from, Miss, uh, I think it was February of this year. And even though the Pinellas County Guardianship Association is not sponsoring or connected in any way with this debate, I would like to read it to you if I can just find the screenshot. Basically, it talks about the Ganellas, uh, the, um, the um, Guardianship Association would like your assistance. We'd like to put together a panel for an open discussion on how to buy or sell a Guardian book of business. Five minutes of approaching. Thank you. Calling out to anyone that has experience in buying or selling a Guardianship cases. We're talking about people. We're talking about your mothers and your fathers, and they're being sold like cattle. Is that ethical? I don't think so. Our third question, and Dr. Sugar, you'll answer this first. The question is, are most guardian violations committed by family or professional guardians? Thank you for the opportunity of addressing that question. If I could just uh, move forward on my presentation. Let's talk about first uh, for-profit guardianship industry. The state allows the industry to strip away the civil rights of people. I think I've told you that. Their assets are legally looted and the victim is penniless. Then Medicare and Medicaid are used with your money and my money to support people who might otherwise have been able to support themselves for years without any assistance. They can't take care of themselves because they're totally dependent on the state. They have no money. They can't hire lawyers. They can't do anything. They're pieces of property. This is America's dirty secret. So, Let's talk about public versus private guardians. Private guardians attack rich people. Uh, excuse me. 
I did not mean to say attack. I meant to say they deal with people of assets. They can invade all assets. The court gives them leave to bring up trusts and estates. They're paid by the minute. And any of, any of us who have gotten bills from guardians and their lawyers know that they count those minutes very carefully. They're always lawyered up, these guardians, because they don't want to deal with the riffraff that's against them. They're always lawyered up. So that in order for me to have taught to the guardian who took my mother-in-law, I think wrongly, I have to hire a lawyer. And then the two lawyers have to talk, then they have to talk to me back and forth. The legal bills start to mount instantly. Then comes the staged litigation, which is extremely expensive. And it's the same judges, one way or the other, who are always appointing the same guardians because they're friends with them. Families are enemies to private guardians. Now, public guardians usually are people without much in the way of assets. The public guardian may not profit from the assets of the ward, at least as long as they're public guardians. But when the assets of the ward dwindle to a point where the property and assets of the ward have to be sold, they suddenly become private wards. Magic. And then they can, the guardians can submit their bills and sell the estate and take all the money that there is. When they're public wards, there's no money to pay lawyers, and there's very little litigation, and it's the same judges all over again, and there's no one around usually to save these people from their situation. There's big money from ca each case. In other words, the guardianship, uh, the private for-profit guardianship case makes money per case. In my case, I will tell you that the legal bills in my case, because we were very strongly opposed to it, partly because they accused us completely falsely. And I might add the Third District Court of Appeal two weeks ago reversed everything that was ever adjudicated against us because it was all lies. There's big money from each case. That's the business model. Take over all the money, maintain the private status, over-medicate the patients so they can't complain. That's called isolate, medicate, and take the estate. All the money is taken from the estate, and then when property has to be sold, they're sold below, below value. And Pinellas County, sad to say, has a nasty history of that exact issue. Now, public guardians make big money from many cases. They can't, they can't take a lot of money from each individual case. But I wanted to say something, Mr. Gutierrez, because you really caught my attention with pro bono. I'm sure you know the meaning of pro bono. Pro bono means you agree not to take money. So I don't understand how you complain that you're, getting paid, you're not getting paid enough for pro bono cases. If your business model doesn't pay you enough, Perhaps you should consider other work. In the public system, people are flipped between the private and public guardianships, and so on and so on. But the bottom line is control and greed in private for profit guardianship is in play. The number of guardianships, professional guardians, has increased 1,800% in the last 12 years. And that enough tells you the Willie Sutton rule. Why do people choose a profession? Why do people want to be in a business? It's because that's where the money is. And in the professional guardianship system, and to a slightly lesser degree, in the public guardianship system, there's a lot of money to be made with little or no educational requirements. In this state, the, the leader in legislation, and you talked about Texas, Texas is an abyss. Five minutes, Mark. Thank you very much. I'll stop with that. Mr. Gutierrez, same question. Are most guardian violations committed by family or professional guardian? Well, I've been told by uh, the courts, the people who monitor uh, registered professional guardians, that most of the violations are by family members. I have to go back to the comment that there's always poor or inadequate professionals across the board whether it's a plumber, electrician, attorney, or physician, just because you graduated from a school and you have some letters after your name does not make you truly competent. What it makes is, I believe, and I argue that you've studied and you've earned that degree, but does it make you competent? I think not. So, what is not understood and is not said is that 
the requirements to become a registered professional guardian. You have to be bonded. You have to have good credit. You have to go through a background check. And we leave it up to the government, the courts, to monitor us, to make sure that on a yearly basis, when we have to re-register every year, that we comply with the state statutes. So are we regulated? You betcha. In fact, we get a lot of blame for things that are not really ours. For instance, I could call DCF on any guardian and say they're abusing or mistrust or abusing or taking money from their patient. The way DCF works over here is they call the guardian and say, I got a complaint against you. I want to hear you. You come over here. And so many of my colleagues will comply with DCF. I don't take that approach because I believe in due process. If there's a legitimate complaint, well, DCF, you prove it, because I don't have to answer questions of innuendo and facts that are not proven. And if you don't cooperate DCF, they send you to um, the state attorney's office. Ooh, now they're getting really trying to intimidate guardians. Well, I don't take that intimidation at all. But the fact is, is that many guardians who are doing a good job comply with DCF, the state attorney's office, and they have to answer these allegations that are unfounded. Nobody ever hears about those stories, and there's many of them. So, I believe that family guardians are, have more complaints, and again, I can only go by at least our court system here, and every time they make a uh, presentation, that question is usually asked. And they say most violations are committed by family guardians. Now, you have to also identify what's a violation. If a guardian turns in a annual report late, is that a violation? I think not, but again, violations committed the most are, are mostly committed by family guardians. Thank you, sir. We'll now move on to the audience question portion. When several were submitted, we will uh, ask three of them. Uh, the first question that we chose was uh, deals with property, guardians, and property. And the question is. Are guardians allowed to take the ward's personal property, this writer says cars, for example, without a judge's order? Are guardians allowed to take personal property without a judge's order? Mr. Gutierrez, you will answer that first. No, they're not. They have to get permission in order to take any uh, property of a guardian. In fact, the initial inventory is just that. You inventory what assets your ward patient has. And you cannot sell, you cannot give away home, an automobile, jewelry, money without permission from the court. Okay. Dr. Sherry, you respond to that and it deals with Yeah, I know the question. How long do I have? Five minutes? Five minutes. <laughs> oh my, 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 my. Um, I told you that I was going to tell you not how it was supposed to work, but how it really works. And there are a number of heads nodding on this side of the room who can testify to the fact that it just doesn't work that way. We have one lovely lady in the audience who can talk at length about the legitimacy of um, lists of, a, of um, what do you call it? jewelry, millions of dollars of jewelry that just disappeared from the second fake inventory, because she has the first one. We have somebody in the audience today who can talk to us about a car being sold without a court order. We have people in the audience who can tell you very clearly about an endless array of instances where money, goods, assets, not to mention blood, not to mention pain, are taken under the umbrella of a judge's court order. 
judges rubber stamp anything the guardian wants. You know why? Because no one has an opportunity in an effective way to stand in their way. Guardianship happens under cover of night. It happens so fast that no human being can possibly be prepared for defense or to, def to stand up for their loved one in two days. Now, that's part of the rules we changed in the new law that took effect in July. But in effect, once a guardian or their lawyer appears in court and an ETG is demanded by the judge in emergency temporary guardianship, game's over. We don't have a single person in our organization that has managed to extract a loved one from a guardianship that began with an ETG. And I will tell you in our survey of our membership a few months ago, nearly 100% of the for-profit guardianships started out with a petition for an emergency temporary guardianship. So the question is, do guardians have the ability, I didn't say the right, do they have the ability to take assets without a court order? Sure they do. Whether they have the right or not, it's what we see. So there's this cognitive dissonance. We expect the court to maintain protections of civil process, due diligence, etc., etc. But instead what happens is that this court, which is impossible to understand, because it's a court of equity, not a court of law, where one man or one woman decides everything based on the narrative they've been told. So the narrative goes, hey, this person is a terrible person, they're trying to kill their relative, they've stolen money, they've abused, neglected, exploited. Judge, come on, give us some protection here. And the next thing you know, all the assets are gone. And you see all the nodding heads in the audience. I'm not talking from anything but real experience. So the answer is, who knows? OK, the next question submitted by the audience, and Dr. Sugar, you will start with this one. How do you propose to meet the needs of people who have nobody to advocate for them? Sorry about that. Writing's a little sloppy. How do you propose to meet the needs of people who have nobody to advocate for them when they cannot advocate for themselves? Now, that's a good question. And I don't have the answer. However, I, what I do know is that Statute 744 and 765 and all the others that are attached to it were designed and intended to do precisely that. These statutes, which originated in the 1980s, were originally brought forth by the homeless crisis in the United States, where there were lots of people perceived to be in need who had no one or didn't want anyone to help them. They were living on the streets. And this all really kind of began in South Beach, uh, Florida, unfortunately. Um, and the statutes evolved over the years as an attempt to deal with this crisis because it is an ongoing crisis, especially nowadays with the financial issues in this country. There are lots of people who need help. And what we expect is that those laws be used for that intended purpose. Instead, what we have witnessed is the manipulation of those laws, particularly by the ever-expanding number of professional guardians in the state of Florida. There were 12 in 19... 92, I think. Yeah, 1992. There were 12. Today, there are 560. I think that's the right number. I might be off a little bit there. It's an 1,800% increase. Why? Because that's where the money is. It's an easy way to make a lot of money if you're friendly with the judge. In fact, I remember in Tallahassee, a very high-ranking individual in the uh, Pinellas Guardianship Association said the following. We know all the judges. We know all the lawyers. Of course they appoint us. I think that's what you said. Um, taking care of people who need taking care of is an elemental part and a fundamental part of our society. It's been that way for thousands of years. It is the basic underlying principle of the Judeo-Christian ethic. The fact that we don't is an embarrassment. The fact that there are so many people who are abused by the very laws intended to protect them is criminal, in my opinion. And the people who are exploiting 
this attempt to help the helpless should be ashamed of themselves. Okay, Mr. Gutierrez, you need to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. It is, how do you propose to meet the needs of people who have nobody to advocate for them when they cannot advocate for themselves? Well, first of all, I'm not uh, a friend of the judges here, in fact. <laughs> they probably um, um, don't look at um, me kindly. But uh, the moral obligation comes from within. And as Dr. Sugar mentioned, it's God's perspective of love your neighbor. And sometimes, guess what? You don't get paid, sometimes you do. But we have a fiduciary responsibility to help those who cannot help themselves. And that's the reason why I got into this profession, because I wanted to advocate for those who cannot defend themselves. Uh, does it take a lot of sacrifice? You betcha. It's hard work. It's long work. Sometimes we're not even credited with the work. We are sometimes criticized because of the people that we help and how we help them. But the responsibility belongs to society in general. And guardians, professional guardians, is a noble profession. And as I mentioned before, is that all guardians are not good guardians. That's the fact of life. But all doctors aren't good doctors and lawyers and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, there's some bad apples, and we have to correct that. But those of us who are in here day in, day out, get calls at three in the morning, we have to go down to the hospital to do our rounds because we have to make a decision to withhold or withdraw medical treatment, and especially if you're not being compensated for that. Well, that's a responsibility that I accept, I will always accept, and that's why I got into this profession. Our final audience question deals with transparency. And we need to switch out and off the store. My final question deals with transparency and basically is there enough in the system? The question is, wouldn't more transparency reduce abuse? Wouldn't more transparency reduce abuse? Mr. Gutierrez, you will answer that first. Yes, I, I believe more transparency would reduce abuse. But how do we go about doing this? There's probably many, many ways, many methods. Uh, people who have good ideas, who haven't brought them forward, who can contribute to this profession, to guardian, guardianship in general. I believe that many of our patients who are under guardianship already have some type of transparency in the fact that there are public documents that anyone can research and look at. You can find out how many guardians an individual has by going to the courthouse, where these patients are at, where they're living at. But transparency is critical. It provides credibility to not only to the profession, but to all those involved in any type of guardianship. Having said that, again, I have to go back to the statement that are they all, all guardians good? No, they're not. But the ones who are, who dedicate themselves to this profession, provide that transparency. They are willing to sit down with family members, with anyone, to discuss and to contribute to the well-being 
of any and all of their patients. Dr. Shiggy, you have five minutes. Would more transparency reduce abuse? That's the question. Yeah. My apologies, Kathleen. How about this for transparency? Picture tells a thousand words. This lovely, adorable senior was taken into guardianship by a professional guardian. During guardianship, this is what happened to her. And towards the end of guardianship, this is what's left of her. A picture tells a thousand words. This is not how a loving family member would take care of their mother. What Mr. Gutierrez says is correct. He does do some stuff for free. He does. He does get called at 3 in the morning. But that's your choice. It's your choice to be in that business. If your business model doesn't work for you, find a different business model. But in this country, trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars are given freely to family members from other families to take care of their elderly patients at their time of need. The amount that they get paid is zero. Their business model doesn't exist. The only thing they're doing it for is love. Now, are there bad family guards? Of course there are. It's human nature when you're taking care of somebody else's money, you know. Maybe you deserve more, but certainly they deserve to get paid. If you deserve to get paid, how much more so does a family member deserve to get paid? Let me move on a little bit to show you another situation. The picture's a little bit small, but this is a very lively and beautiful mother before guardianship. This is her. That's her destroyed by guardianship. Just a vegetable. So, transparency? Ha! Transparency. Ask anybody in the audience who's been involved with guardianship how much transparency. For example, in my case, which is five years old, and my mother-in-law has been bed for nearly two and a half years. Do you know that I first saw the inventory yesterday? I've been begging to see it for five years. Just yesterday. Is that because the judge is no good? No. Is it because the system's no good? Yes. Is it because there's reasons to withhold that? Well, maybe, as in your case, the inventory is kind of diminished, like a lot of jewelry disappeared. It's not one case, it's not two cases, it's not Florida, it's the entire country, and in fact, it's the entire world. Guardianship thrives on opacity. Guardianship is the antithesis of translucent or transparent, and the only reason that the abuses we so fervently complain about in guardianship take place is because they take place under cover of law, in courts of equity, not courts of law. There are fundamental, essential, foundational problems with the way we deal with guardianship, and they have to be reversed. In order for guardianship to be really transparent, there would be no guardians. Okay, and that does it for the question uh, segment of this. We will now do closing arguments. These will be 10 to 15 minutes long. Dr. Sugar, you are first.